That this is a threat to Rome. This is a threat to the region. It's talk of revolution. The baptism of John is revolutionary. The baptism that you're going to undertake here on this property is revolutionary. It's not just some exterior following of some religious observance. It's something that digs down deep into your hearts and causes a heart revolution. It's something is turning inside of you and you don't want to live that way anymore. You want to stand in opposition to the world and die to your old self. We're talking about death here. Not a pretty religious service. We're talking about dying and living a new man. Do you want to do it? Are you ready for a revolution to well up inside of you? Because that's John's baptism. message is John the message. And so in looking at John the man last week, we understand the context of who John is. And so we can better understand his message and what he's saying. And so we're going to look at Matthew starting off today. Matthew chapter 11, verse 7. And we're going to be looking at Christ's proclamation of who John is. We're going to start in verse 2 as we look at John the message. Verse 2, chapter 11 of Matthew says this, And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one or should we look for another. And so we fast forwarded at the beginning of this message to the end of John's life. John is in prison. We're going to talk about why he's in prison. There's, there's um, a panoramic view of why he's in prison from history, extra biblical history, as well as the Gospels that give an even deeper look at why he's in prison. But we see that John in the beginning, in the book of John, not John the Baptist, but the book of John. Um, we see John chapter 1, verse 28 through 30, that when Jesus approaches John, his response is this, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist is a Jewish man. He knows what the Lamb of God represents. He understands the Passover Lamb. And his proclamation of Jesus is not that he's a Passover lamb for one time, but he is the lamb of God which was slain from the foundations of the earth, that he is the lamb of God that will take away the sin of the world. And so this is his proclamation of Jesus, but now we're fast forwarded to the end of John's life, and he's in prison, and he's asking the question, are you the one? So what's happened? What's happened in between that, that John is now asking? He wants some reassurance. And I think this is something we see. We saw in the story of Gideon constantly wanting reassurance. John is a man, and he's not a sinless man. There was only one sinless man. That is Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. John is a man of flesh and bone, a man with temptations like ours, a man with struggles like ours, a man with doubts like ours. He makes this bold proclamation at Christ's baptism. I'm not worried to unloose his sandals. He says to Jesus, you should be baptizing me. But Jesus persists, and John then <coughs> baptizes Jesus. He's made this proclamation, but now he's in jail. He's in a dark place. He's in a place where... He's been separated from his public ministry. He's in a low place. And just like all humanity, he's asking questions. Now, he hasn't completely lost faith because he still acknowledges that Jesus is somebody. But the question is not, are you somebody? Are you a prophet? Are you a good person? Are you a man of God? The question is, are you the one? The Mashiach, the Messiah that was foretold in the prophets. He wants some reassurance and 
He gets it. The disciples then go to Jesus of, of John and say, are you the one or should we wait for another? And they go, and Jesus says, go back and tell John this. The blind see, the lame walk, and the dead rise. He's proclaiming the, the miracles that are happening. Well, I would also say one of the reasons John is struggling here is the same reason the entire nation of Israel, and not just Israel, but any of those who came in contact with Jesus were struggling. To understand the full scope of what he was going to accomplish. When Jesus starts talking about the cross, they begin to resist him. When he sets his face toward Jerusalem and he says, I must go suffer great things, Peter says, no, Lord. In other passages, they say, at this time, Lord, will you restore the kingdom? What are they wanting? They're wanting a Messiah to rule and reign. And, and rightfully so, the Gospels and the Old Testament and prophecy speaks of a conquering Messiah. They're looking for a Messiah that can free them from Rome's, Rome's tyranny. They're looking for revolutionaries like the Maccabees who came um, moments before in history, who liberated Israel and had, they had their own autonomous a nation for a while. They're looking for somebody like David, an anointed king like David. They're looking for an anointed prophet like Elisha. They're looking for somebody who can do something here and now. And he did do something here and now, but it wasn't just here and now. It was for all time. Because he says, before Abraham, I was. He's the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. It's not for one space in time in 30 AD. It's for all time. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He's not a king who will sit on a temporary throne. He is a king who will reign forever. So we see John is not quite there in understanding the full scope of what it was. But if John could see forward to Cache, Oklahoma, in some rural area at the foothills of the Wichita Mountains, and a room packed full of men who had believed in him, Centuries later, my friend, he would know the full scope, the panoramic view of the Messiah that would liberate humanity for all time, not just one time. How beautiful is the message of John the Baptist, but he's a man like you and me. We're reminded of that. Now we move on to hear about what Jesus says about him. Verse 7, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? This is Jesus speaking about John. <clears throat> a reed shaken by the wind? <clears throat> but what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft garments are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law of the prophets prophesied and, and tell John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. What did you go out to the desert to see? A man with soft hands? Let me put it in our language. <laughs> A soft character who when you shake their hands, it's, it's, it's limp and it's soft like a baby's bottom. What did you go out to the desert to see? A man coming out dressed in fine linens? No, a wild man. John the Baptist. We find later that he's eating grasshoppers, what they call locusts, in the, what you'll read as locusts in the Bible, which is more like a grasshopper, and honey. This honey would more than likely have been date honey, not bee honey, um, for that species. Um, more comparable to what they would have used back then. He's got camel's hair on and a leather belt around his waist. He's in the desert 
One of my teachers, Mark Turnage, says this, the desert is God's classroom. It's where Moses is driven to prepare Moses to liberate God's people in Egypt. It's where uh, Abraham pitches his tents and struggles with God's sovereignty and his call um, as having no children and his wife being barren in her older age and even Abraham struggling and eventually sleeping with his maidservant Hagar for, for his lack of patience. But it's, it's in the desert that these testing moments come. It's where Jesus is driven immediately after his baptism. Do you think there's something about the desert? Is there a reason that John is, is baptizing in the desert, that he's gone out into the wilderness? He's a wild man in the wilderness with camel's hair, eating grasshoppers and date honey, unshaved, nappy hair. Who'd you go out to the desert to see? That's who you go out to the desert to see. You see Moses, who's, who's, who's walking away from Egypt and being prepared. It's not king, king, uh, kingly houses that you see out there. We see Elijah the same, driven to the wilderness after he liberates, um, after he proclaims victory on Mount, Mount Carmel, he then goes to the wilderness. He's even Elijah uh, being dejected in the wilderness and having a back and forth with God with what's going on. My question to you is what wilderness are you in? What is it that God is testing you in? Because you're here for a reason. Many times we want delivery from that desert before we're willing to learn the lesson that God wants you to learn in the desert. There's something he's trying to bring out in you, a dependence on him, because in the desert water is scarce. Food is uh, hard to find. Thus, the grasshoppers... <laughs> What did you go out to the desert to see? And we see this prophecy in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 through 2, that he announces, Behold, I send my messenger. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2 in context of Malachi to give us a bigger picture because when the, when the Jewish people quote a scripture, they know what comes after it. Many times we read a scripture and we don't read the rest of it. It would be beautiful for you to go back and read the entire chapter 3 of Malachi later to see the full scope of what John is, is, is being proclaimed about John. But it says this in Malachi, I will send my messenger. This is decades before Jesus comes on the scene. This is a prophecy before Jesus is even born. Much before. It says this, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty, El Gabor, the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. Those who hear this proclamation of who John is know the rest of that. And when you hear John the Baptist's message, as we'll read in a minute, you understand that this refiner's fire is intense. We've had worship songs. I grew up in the Pentecost faith. And there's, there's songs that say, send the fire, send the fire right now. And typically when people sing that, they don't quite know what they're singing. Like, you know what? We, we understand what fire is. We understand what it means to be burnt the pain that you endure. But this refiner's fire is a fire that, that brings out impurities. But it's fire nonetheless. So it's not a, a cute time in worship. It's a loathsome time in anguish where the fire is brought to your life and it's burning out things. It's typically where we curse. It's typically where we point to someone else and blame someone else because something's being brought out of our lives, because we don't make level, because whatever it is in our lives that we are faced with, then the pressure comes and the real character comes out. Because God wants to refine. He wants to bring it to the surface. Even things that are done that are unfair. 
He uses it all to refine you and to make you into the man of God He desires you to be. Do you really want the fire? So when you're praying next time and a song comes on and says, send the fire, be careful and know what you're asking for. Mm. We move on to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to be reading a few different scriptures today, but in Matthew Matthew 3, what you're going to see is we've already represented John, the gospel of John, and behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of, sin of the world. Now we're in Matthew. We're going to look at Mark and Luke, all of the gospels, and we'll look at extra biblical literature that speaks on of John from the antiquities of Josephus, all giving a picture of who this man is. So he's a forerunner. What's a forerunner? Like today, if the President of the United States came into the room, he's not just going to walk in nonchalantly and sit down. There's going to be someone that goes before him because of his presidential status and the clout that he holds, the authority that he wields, He's not just going to walk in and sit down on the front. and Someone's going to come before and say, Let it, say, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States of America. And people are going to stand and <laughs> Democrats are going to clap and Republicans are going to stand and, and glare at this point. <laughs> and vice versa in the last administration. But it's going to be an announcement. How much more so? When Emmanuel, God with us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh, and He dwelt among us. How much more so God walking into humanity to liberate humanity? How much more so so should there be a forerunner to announce His coming? John the Baptist is a forerunner. He's making an announcement of the coming of the Messiah. This, this passage in Malachi talks about a refiner's fire. He's announcing that you need to get ready because He's coming. Stand at attention. Wake up. The Messiah is coming. Then we move to Matthew chapter 3. And we're going to hear more about John's message here. Matthew chapter 3, we'll start in, in verse 2. I'll just read the whole thing there, verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. There you go again, wilderness. And saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. We've heard of from Malachi. Now we're hearing from Isaiah. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make the way of the Lord Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. John the Baptist would not be welcome in most of our churches. He would make everybody uncomfortable. Pretty sure he would make us uncomfortable. Because he is calling out sin. He is a, a brash man. He's intense. Most people would say, settle down, John. Can't we all just get along? Come worship with us. He's rejected the temple as we found last week. He's preaching. He's preaching loudly. He's saying repent. He's confronting people. Mm. But we say, you know, 
He, who's, he who was, is without sin cast the first stone. We, we quote scriptures out of context and we, we, we get rid of individuals like this who have come into the world to speak truth, to, to paint black and white pictures and to ask us where we stand in that. John the Baptist was that guy. And he's saying in verse 6, confess sins. And they are confessing their sins. My, my question is, what did that look like on the banks of the Jordan as he's baptizing people, as he's preaching repentance? People standing up and saying, forgive me God, forgive me Yahweh, for I'm a sinner, for I'm an adulterer, for I'm lustful in heart. Lord, forgive me because I'm a thief. This, this confession that does the body good. The Bible says confess your sins one to another and be healed. There's a healing that takes place when we confess those things. When we let them out. Some of you need to let it out. And you need to let it go. Maybe not to the entire group, but you need to, to find a, a leader here and say, man, I went through this in my childhood. I struggled with this. This was an issue. I, you need to confess that, man. Let that dross out of your mouth. Not on everybody. <laughs> but let it out to be processed, not to complain or bring negativity, but to get rid of it. And when you get rid of something, it's done, it's gone. You've let it out, it's been confessed one to another, and there's a healing that takes place in your heart. Let it go, men. Confess. And that's what they're doing on the banks of the Jordan. They're confessing their sins. If you're getting baptized this week, confess your sins one to another. Let it out. There's something liberating that is healing about confessing openly. Next we see repentance. Verse 2. He, repentance isn't just confession. Repentance is a life turned the opposite direction and living differently. And you're going to see in a second what that means. That there's, there should be some things that happen after rep confession and repentance. This repentance happens, you're dedicating yourself. I'm not going to live that way anymore. doesn't mean you're not going to struggle. But you come to a place where you've confessed your sin, you're leaving it there, and you're going in the opposite direction of that sin. Verse 10, even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. So John realizes, realizes the um, immediacy of the Mashiach's coming. He's not, say, he's not reared back with the axe. The axe is laid to the root of the tree. It struck the tree. It's time, just like Malachi said, the refiner's fire, the launderer's soap. The, the interaction is here. The Mashiach is on the scene. It's time to repent. There's an urgency about the message. My friend, there's an urgency on my mouth today because it's urgent in your lives. Because the Messiah is coming. Bear fruits worthy of repentance. So there's confession, there's repentance turning away, and then there's the reality of what that means, that you will bear fruit. You will bear fruit. And I'm not talking about rotten fruit, of anger and hate and bitterness. I'm talking about fruit of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, kindness. The fruits of the Spirit will begin to emerge in your lives. We see as he looks at these Pharisees, he says, Who warned you to flee? He's just calling them out. These are respectful people. Pharisees are respected by the nation. John don't care. He says, The fruit's not barren in your life. The axe is laid to the root of the tree. Now bear fruits worthy of repentance. You've got a title. Pharisee, Sadducee, Zealot, Herodian. But where's the fruit? Where's the fruit? We move on. We look at Luke now. Look at another passage of this speaking of, of John in, in Luke chapter 3. I'll go uh, 2 through 6, starting there. While Ananias... 
and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. You're going to hear some repetitiveness here because these are synoptic gospels. They are have similar. Um, they have the same historical account, just different images of it. God came to John, the son of Zacharias. We know who Zacharias is, and it's naming who he is, whose son he is for a reason, because he's a high priest. I mean, not a high priest, but a priest who should be in the temple. He's the son of Zacharias. It's establishing who he is. Verse 3, And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance. There's that word again. For the remission of sin, removal of sin through confession. Like we just read, verse 4, And it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. Now we get a little bit bigger picture of what Isaiah is saying. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth. And all flesh shall see the glory of God. We see this announcement in verse 2 through 6 of the Messiah coming. The first thing I want to look at is preparing the way. Preparing the way connotates action on your part. Faith without works is dead. There's action through confession, through repentance. What is this action in this picture that is painted there? That mountains should be brought low, that valleys should be filled, that crooked ways should be made straight. Why? Well, Hebrews gives us a better picture of that. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12 through 13 says this, Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet. Undoubtedly, that making straight paths for your feet is a direct correlation to what we've read already in the, in the synoptic Gospels. And make straight paths for your feet so that what's lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. So there's this idea of confession and repentance, but what do I do? I hear that time and time again in Teen Challenge. Like, what do you, what do you mean? Like, I don't know how to do that. How do I actually forgive? How do I actually make this happen? A, B, and C. Give me a way to follow it. Well, Hebrews does. Feeding off of the Gospels. Make straight paths for your feet. This practical language that if there's something dislocated, if your hip's dislocated, we probably shouldn't hike to the top of Elk Mountain here. Just practical wisdom. So my question, putting it on your terms, what valleys need to be filled? What mountains need to be brought low? What crooked ways need to be made straight in your life? Only you can answer that. I promise you this, it's not driving down that old street just to see what's going on when you get your 5 and 10 day. That's not a straight path for a dislocated hip. I just want to see. I just want to see the old neighborhood. I just want to reminisce. Come on, man. Yep, that's the place. Huh. I wonder what they're doing inside. I'm going to tell you, if you've opened the door to go down the street, you've opened the door to go in the house. Your heart's already there. You know what you're doing. The heart is deceitfully wicked. Hmm. <coughs> is it your Aunt May May's medicine cabinet? Is that a straight path? Is it a, a little rendezvous with an ex-girlfriend? I'm going to witness to her, man. Tell her about Jesus. Tell her what Jesus has done in my life. Your hip's dislocated. You need to get back to the hospital. The Bible says even the strong are taken down by her, the immoral woman. I'm not, you know, I'm not dogging at your girlfriend. I'm, don't fight me later. Um, but you get what I'm saying. We're men. If there's a door you shouldn't open and tempt your dislocated hip with, it's probably that. Now let me just speak from experience. And I'm being recorded, so so be it. On my 10-day pass as a student in 1997, I slept with my old girlfriend. 
And listen, the whole first part of us meeting up was me telling her about Jesus. <laughs> Boy, that was a terrible witness, right? I mean, really? No fruits of repentance. And all the words that I said all fell to the ground. Matter of fact, just painted a better image of a hypocrite that she already believed existed. You see, we must make straight paths for our feet. Because ultimately, we know what we're doing when we crack that door open. The Bible says sin is crouching at, at your door and it's desirous to master you. You crack that door and you give the devil a foothold, that door's coming open. He will pry it as you cling to it with all your strength because you've already opened it in your heart. Some of us need to make some straight paths. We need to fill some valleys. We need to make some crooked ways straight. We need to bring some mountains down. We're not doing it. We're doing it by the power of God because he's, he's prescribed it here. And we're just doing what he's prescribed because what he prescribes works. Your hands that hang down that are weary, your feeble knees, your dislocated hip needs a straight path to walk on. Some of you guys need to call home and say, can you change the password to the computer before I come back home? Because I don't need the temptation of scrolling around and the pathways that it could lead to. How about some practical tools that we really apply to our lives to really walk on straight paths and allow the Lord to walk in our lives? Because the Lord doesn't want to walk through that whorehouse with you. He's prescribed a path in which you will be safe. Now, there's a time where your hips relocated and your feeble knees are strengthened. doesn't mean we, we, we test those boundaries, but there's a time where God can call you into some dangerous places. It ain't now. There's places now God says, do not go there, Lauren. And so I don't. Make straight paths for your feet. Fill the valleys. Bring the mountains down. Make the crooked way straight so that what's lame may not be dislocated but rather be healed. Do good. Verses 11 uh, through 14 there of Luke says this. Luke um, chapter, chapter 3. Let me read the rest of this. As then, as then, as then, um, excuse me. As then Jesus um, shows us Practical tools, just like Hebrews showed, showed us practical tools. Chapter 3, we'll start in uh, verse 11. He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. It's a practical idea of dying to self, giving um, to others. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then tax collectors also came and were baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed to you. Obviously, the tax collector has a money issue with money and with materialism. So Jesus is putting his finger on what they deal with. Or uh, John the Baptist is. And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed to you. Likewise, the soldier asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely. Be content with your wages. He puts his finger on both of the issues they're dealing with. Their uncontentment because of their wages, because they're not paid enough. And their intimidation. <laughs> People who wield power many times use it in intimidating ways. To make themselves look bigger, to look better. Unfortunately, we see it in law enforcement. It's one of the reasons we have the problem we have right now in our nation. Because people think they need to flex and exert their power. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I support police officers. I have financially as well um, through my many court experiences. And I've supported local counties, states, and the federal government. I, I get it. But we know when someone is intimidating and, and taking their power and using it in a wrong way. Unfortunately, it's sometimes Teen Challenge staff members do it. Unfortunately, I'm sure I've done it at times and gotten in the flesh and had to apologize later. Because when authority is given, it's easy to take it too far. 
to puff out our chest and say, I'm in charge. When John's putting his finger on the issue with these soldiers, man, quit intimidating people. Quit using your power for the wrong reasons and be content with your wages. So we see hmm, this reality, this making the valleys, filling the valleys, bringing the mountains down, making the crooked way straight. John is showing them how to do it. Here's A, B, and C if you want A, B, and C. Verse 15, now as the people were in expectation, all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not. John answered saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Remember fire from Malachi, the refiner's fire. He's doing what? Pointing to himself? Say, I'm the greatest prophet that ever lived? Because he was. Jesus said it. No. He's pointing to Jesus. At this time, thousands have flocked to hear John preach. Many times when we see John, for some reason we see like 30, 40, maybe 200 people around. This is not the case. You'll see that here in a minute in Josephus. His speaking of John the Baptist. He, he, he has drawn crowds. It's easy for ego to be lifted up, for his eloquent messages, for his, his bold stance. But instead, he does what? Not points to himself. He points to Jesus. In making straight paths for our feet, we prepare a way. We do good, and we point to Jesus. Because it's through Jesus that we can walk that path. We, we're going to end in, in Mark as we now finalize all of the, the four Gospels and looking at John. We look at Mark chapter 6, verse 17. It says this, For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John, this is right before he's in prison, and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he married her. Well, let me give you a little Jerry Springer show here. For those of you who are older, you understand that, uh, that context. This man, Herod Antipas, so Herod the Great is dead. That's the Herod the Great that builds Temple Mount and does all these amazing things. His sons are now reigning, and the, the kingdom has been split up between his sons. Herod Philip is in the far north, and Herod Antipas is in Tiberias around the Galilee on the west side of the Galilee. At this point, he's around the Dead Sea region. Um, as Josephus lets us know in a more inside story to that, um, in this area that's been excavated. And that's where he's having his birthday party. Now, this is a debaucherous, lewd, drunken party. This is something that was celebrated in that culture as they would feast and, 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 and live a life of excess. And we can imagine what that is without going into great detail. So there's this elaborate party that's happening. And he is in prison. Let's see what Josephus says about this. Listen to this. It's a little long, but listen. Shows you the large crowds that, that John was bringing, the eloquence of his sermons and his threat to the region. He was a good man and had exhorted the Jews to lead righteous lives, to practice justice toward their fellows and piety towards God. Sound familiar? And do good. And so doing, practice justice toward their fellows and piety towards God and, and so doing, join in baptism. Sound familiar? When others too joined, the crowds about him because they were aroused to the highest degree by his sermons. Herod became alarmed, says Herod Antipas. Eloquence that had so great an effect on mankind might lead to some form of sedition. For it looked as if they would be guided by John in everything that they did. Herod decided, therefore, that it would be much better to strike first and be rid of him before he, his work led to an uprising. 
then to wait for an upheaval. Get involved in a difficult situation and see his mistake. Though John, because of Herod's suspicion, was brought in chains to Macarius. This is the place I was talking about around the Dead Sea that's been excavated. The stronghold that we have previously mentioned and there put to death. So, we, we see a few things in this extra biblical account, this historical account. We see a lot of the same things the Gospels are saying. He's a teacher of piety. He's telling them to do good things, to do good works, all of that we talked about. It also says that he's an eloquent speaker. So much so that a great majority, it says, have flocked to him. And they're hanging on his every word so much that they're doing everything he says. They're not just hearing John. They are ready to do what he says. He's amassed large groups and there's suspicion on Herod's part. Why? Because Jerusalem, the Galilee, is the birthplace of Jewish rebellion. It's one of the reasons they have an issue with Jesus. If he's some remote, bucolic, backwater preacher that has a hundred followers, they wouldn't have given him the time of day. But he's feeding the 5,000. Thousands upon thousands are flocking. Similar to John's ministry. Their crowds are swelling in these outer regions. And Herod Antipas is saying, this is dangerous. The power that these puppet kings like Herod Antipas and Herod Philip hold is hanging by a thread. And Rome would just as soon release them of their duties and kill them if they can't hold the peace. We see it time and time again in the Gospels that, that the crowds would swell and Jesus would go across the lake. That this is revolution talk. <clears throat> He's, he's a brash man. He's not just saying, love your neighbor, do peace. He's saying those things. But he's calling out people. So he calls out Herod Antipas for his immorality. This man's in high authority. And he calls him out and he says, man, you're an adulteress. You've married your brother Philip's wife, Herodias. You're an adulterous man. You're sinful. The Gospels give us a different account of Herodias' Herodias's anger toward John the Baptist, which we'll see in the end of the story here. But we also see this other side that Josephus brings, that this is a threat to Rome. This is a threat to the region. It's talk of revolution. The baptism of John is revolutionary. The baptism that you're going to undertake here on this property is revolutionary. It's not just some exterior following of some Religious observance. It's something that digs down deep into your hearts and causes a heart revolution. And something is turning inside of you and you don't want to live that way anymore. You want to stand in opposition to the world and die to your old self. We're talking about death here. Not a pretty religious service. We're talking about dying and living a new man. Do you want to do it? Are you ready for a revolution to well up inside of you? Because that's John's baptism. Not just some religious duty. There's revolution on his lips. There's fury in his voice. And he's making people mad. And I love it. <laughs> he calls out the one with the most authority in that region, Herod Antipas. He says, you adulterous swine. I'm ad living here, so don't stone me later. And his wife is angry. And she's back in, you know, Herod Antipas's ear. And the gospel says there's another purpose for imprisoning John. So, John, so Herod can kill two birds with one stone. He can squelch the rebellion, seeming rebellion. And he can also pacify his wife, which is not really his wife. Because it's his brother's wife and it's not a legal marriage. Hmm. So Salome enters this debaucherous party. Many times in, 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 in movies, we see Salome come in, this prepubescent girl doing some kind of like cute little dance. It's not what it was. This was a seductive, erotic dance that's happening from his brother Philip's daughter. Herod's parties were infamous. You can understand this from history. This is his birthday party. Salome enters the scene and she dances her dance. And after it's over, Herod is aroused. He is excited and he beckons to her and says, I will give you anything up to half my kingdom. 
so Salome goes back to her mom. Remember the mom? Herodias says, hey, mom, what should I ask for? Herodias says, it's time. Mm, I want his head on a platter. And at this point, she goes back to Herod, and Herod is upset. Because the Gospels tell us, and you read this passage later, we don't have time today, but that Herod is upset when this happens because he holds John as a, as a holy man. He's even listened to John and his teachings and been moved by them somewhat. And now he's spoken in front of this large group and he has to follow through with what he says. And so, so he, he calls the executioners. They go and they behead John and they bring his head in on a platter. This is the life of the greatest prophet to ever live. The prophet that would herald the coming of the Mashiach. The prophet that would lay the path for salvation as Jesus walks on that highway and he gives his very life as a bridge between deceitful, wicked hearts of men and a holy, righteous God. This is John the Baptist. Let's bow our heads. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this man, John the Baptist. We, as men, Lord, we can admire him. His stance, his boldness, his courage, the truth that he spoke, the eloquence of his message, the position he holds in the biblical account being the fulfillment of the, of the prophet Elijah. God, we look at the life he lived and the message he gave. Lord, and we pray that you would bring the mountains down, you would fill the valleys, and you would make the crooked way straight. You would show us what those things are in our lives that we need to consecrate to you. Lord, and what we are doing, Lord, is we are uh, giving this highway of holiness in our lives so that what's dislocated, so what's weak in us can walk. Lord, strengthen our feeble hands. Lord, heal that which is broken. We look at this message today, God, and we ask, make the path straight. In Jesus' precious name, amen, 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 amen. God bless you guys. Have a good day.